morning to the distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. We welcome you all to the virtual sessions of the Career Guidance Program, Avenue 2023. The ongoing event, Avenue, initiated its proceeding on the 7th of December with Career Talk sessions at Indian School, Dasset. The online Career Talk sessions are scheduled for today, 8th December, streaming from Indian School, Dasset, followed by the Career Expo at Alphalaj Hotel. The valedictory function will be held at Indian School Dasset on 9th December, followed by the Career Expo at Alphalaj Hotel. We are delighted to extend a warm welcome to one and all for Avenue 2023, a forerunner in the career guidance event, which is meticulously organized by Indian School Dasset under the aegis of the Board of Directors, Indian Schools in Oman. This invaluable event is a beacon of knowledge, resources, and expert guidance carefully designed to illuminate the path towards future career choices. As we witness how education options are becoming increasingly intricate, making informed decisions and about one's career journey is ever challenging. Avenue 2023 seeks to address these challenges by offering a comprehensive platform filled with insights, information, and expert advice on various university courses and services. What's next? A question that we ponder upon as we embrace ourselves to explore a sea of options that lay ahead of us. It's a question that opens the avenues for a plethora of opportunities in specific fields. When we embark on this journey of finding our true interest and pursuing our goals, Avenir steps in, guiding and inspiring students as they prepare for change, transition, growth and realization of their aspirations. Mr. Saurav Chatterjee, the speaker of this session, is here to give us a brand new perspective on new categories in the field of game design and development. A spark of information is good enough to light up our future. Let's listen to the expert talks where students and parents alike can equip themselves with insights shared by our experts today. Make wise career decisions with impeccable experiences gathered and shared by our expert speakers. Saurav Chatterjee is an exceptionally passionate software developer with robust problem-solving abilities, who looks for opportunities to challenge his creativity and programming skills in the domain of game de development. He has done his educational training in Bachelor of Technology in Computer Science and Engineering from Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, Azad University of Technology, West Bengal, India. He has a rich experience in the field of developing mobile games and PvP multiplier games with the additional skills that include excellent command over version controlling, high proficiency in optimizing games and tools or editor scripting in Unity, thorough understanding of design pat patterns, MVC and communicative English. He has done backend development for Hills of Steel 2. His career journey includes being a game programmer with Game Annex Inc. in Ahmedabad, lead game programmer with Funcell Games Private Limited in Kolkata, senior game programmer with Lighthearted Entertainment in Helsinki, Finland, game programmer with Surplus Games, Helsinki, Finland. Currently, he is working at Unity Technologies in Helsinki, Finland as a senior software engineer. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for the um, uh, rousing welcome. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit about game design and development and maybe to inspire some curiosities into people who are already um, who already want to be game developers when they grow up or who like to play games and want to know what goes behind the scenes uh, in actually making those games. So may I request uh, to start the slides, please?
Yeah. So this is this is the uh, the title of today's talk is about navigating the future of game design and development. And um, you have already heard about me. My name is Saurav Chatterjee. I'm a senior software engineer, and I currently work at Unity Technologies. Uh, may we go to the next slide, please? I'm going to skim over through this because um, we have already talked about my background. I'm originally from India. Now I'm based in Helsinki, Finland. I have uh, eight years of game development experience so far. I have shipped 100 plus games, mostly on mobile development platforms, but also on Xbox, PlayStation, Switch, and PC. The major game engines that I've worked with are Unity, Unreal Engine, Godot, and Cocos. But my primary uh, proficiency lies mainly in the Unity engine. Uh, the next slide, please. Yes, so here we are going to start our talk. Uh, so people who have been playing video games uh, today or maybe a decade ago or maybe even two decades ago, this is for them. Video games started out late in 1950s, actually, when somebody used a electrical device to create a version of Pong. That was the first that was the first known advent of video game but the video game as an industry or something that people would do as a career only started out in the 1970s where excuse me where atari uh, the company uh, who was one of the pioneers of uh, console development they released their first game called pong and then in 1980s we had nintendo of course the very well known nintendo nes systems they started developing their own games and also developing their uh, own hardware. Back in those days, uh, the hardware manufacturers would develop the games also because there was not a game engine that was universally used or there was not a real technology that was being uh, used for developing games. The only way of developing something was basically combining the hardware and software together. We get a little more modularity when we come to the 1990s where 3D graphics and multimedia consoles become a boom in the industry. We, we suddenly see a lot of 3D games, for example, uh, early versions of Lara Croft or Cricket or even a version of Mario. Every console developer and every video game developer tries to develop 3D. The main uh, reason for that was because of a certain technology called graphics acceleration, which was being done in a specified hardware unit called the graphics processing unit or the GPU. Then in 2000s, we see the mobile gaming search, for example, uh, and also online uh, online games like MMORPG, World of Warcraft, uh, DC Online. There are lots of games that were based on online games and mobile gaming uh, was just picking up at that point of time because of the smartphone revolution, which started around 2006, six seven with the advent of the iPhone. Then in 2010s, we see a lot of indie game developers, they break out. They, uh, you know, they, they start like games stop becoming a thing about big developers and a lot of smaller studios or even single developers started out and uh, started to make their own games. That led to a bit of a push in the industry. So a lot of people with a lot of bright ideas come in and they are trying to push the boundaries. We see a lot of technologies like VR, AR, and other realities, mixed realities as they're called, come to the forefront because there were a lot of people who were trying to experiment with, with, the, with the technologies that were available or they were trying to invent, innovate, pioneer uh, some technologies uh, for, uh, for, for entertainment purposes and for making their games more reachable and more thrilling for the player. We are in 2020s now, and now the next big things that we hear about are AI and cloud gaming. Cloud gaming, uh, or which, which is otherwise known as streaming, uh, streaming of games. Uh, we have Xbox Game Pass, which streams games. We used to have Google Stadia. There's also a version of PlayStation that lets you stream, uh, stream your games. The games actually run on a cloud server somewhere. You don't have to have a beefy hardware to, you know, to do play a really high-end game. You just need to have a stable internet connection that's high enough to let the throughput so that your game can run somewhere in some other part of the world and it can be shown to you uh, live as you're making the moves in the game uh, to basically let you play it. It's almost like Netflix. Um, yeah, so that's that's where we are at. That's, that's how the industry shaped up throughout the years. Uh, next slide, please. 
the current landscape, the most amount of things that we see, at least in the, you know, the early 2020s are mobile games. They are still as popular. They are, they, they constitute the major part of the gaming industry right now because everyone has a mobile phone. Mobile games are largely accessible because they're free to play. They're hyper casual. They are just pick and go when you're playing. Then we see a lot of other games which are made by smaller publishers called indie games, which do not typically do not have a very big budget, which do not typically have a large group of people working on them. They are typically very small group of people, very passionate uh, group of individuals who want to create a game that they believe in uh, and also are constantly pushing the boundaries, the envelope, because they don't really, they are not really in it to make money. Of course, making money is, is a byproduct of having a business but the main idea in indie games is to create games that are fun for the player and games that are basically innovative um, then also we have ai in games here a little bit of plug this is from unity we have very recently started uh, uh, started rolling out two versions of our ai operations one is muse which is more like a chat gpt for you to make a game if you go to muse then uh, you can ask muse to teach you how to create a game and it will, uh, it will give you uh, all the instructions to open up Unity Editor particularly and, and create the game that you want to do step by step, even with scripts and everything else. Then there is another another um, another product that Unity has called Centis. Centis is uh, is a you know live AI in your game. Like if you want to make your enemies a little bit more difficult, or if you want to have live conversations in your game, then Centis is the product that is being placed for that particular segment. Uh, as a footnote to this to this particular slide, I would like to uh, point your attention to the career growth in game development. Game development, games in general, is a very big industry. It can rival Hollywood in terms of uh, the revenue generated, in terms of the amount of money spent and earned, and the rise in employment is quite constant. Although every other field is facing some sort of a recession uh, uh, from COVID and after that, uh, game development is a field which has been going strong quite well. So far in the past five fiscal years, ending in 2022, we have seen a constant growth of over 3.5% of employment, which is very big news because even major software development streams has dried up. And we hear a lot of news of layovers here and there, but game development thankfully is still in 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 a in a good shape next slide please and if you are going to talk about uh, future prediction of course it is very difficult to predict any kind of future when people started game development in 1970s they couldn't predict the future that in 20 years or 30 years they are going to see massively multiplayer online games but giving the you know relatively stable uh, steady uh, development of technology from now onwards we can safely say that uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, all these things are going to be very big deal in the upcoming future because of the advent of technology. Meta or Facebook has just launched uh, Meta Quest 3. Uh, we have had the PlayStation VR 2 launch a few months ago, earlier this year. And then we uh, we are hearing about the, the VR headset from Apple, which is going to launch next year. So... Uh, lots of good news for, for for consumers who want to play games on those devices. Lots of good news for developers who want to develop for those devices. Of course, internet connection is becoming stabler and stabler and, and the throughput is faster and much more expansive than previous. So I, I could safely assume that in a few years, we probably won't be needing a lot of in-situ or in-house hardware to play a lot of games will probably just stream them on a device which we own maybe even on your tv and you can enjoy console quality gameplay over there and then there are emerging genre and technology what i mean by emerging genre are more or less ai but it is mixed with not just development but also the maintenance of a game so there, these are some technologies that might come up that ai is going to enable us to do in the future uh, so yeah, that's, that's, you know, those are my three predictions for at least for the next decade of game development. Uh, can we go to the next slide? And what kind of skills do, do we need to, to, to come into this particular field to, you know, to, to try and be a game developer? Uh, so these are more or less the four major areas. Of course, 
these areas have their own specializations and their own um, own set of uh, idiosyncrasies or 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 things that you know particular people are very good at. So I'm a programmer myself, so I have a particular bias towards being a programmer. So programmers come on top. Programmers can be people who make the games, people who make the engine, people who make the graphics work, people who optimize the games, people uh, who play the games and test the games and then make changes to those uh, based on their testing. Uh, even people who, who run the back end of the game, people who run the servers of the game and so on and so forth. So programmers on all levels of game development, very, very important profession. But it is not as generalized as I am sounding probably now because programmers are very specialized. Uh, of course, all of them are software developers to some degree, but their area of specialization uh, varies very widely from one another. For example, somebody who's working on just the game using some pre-existing engine or an in-house engine is uh, probably not aware of what goes under the hood of the engine. That is a very diff different task. Somebody who's optimizing physics for a game probably doesn't have as good a grasp over the graphics of the engine than somebody who's actually doing that stuff. Then if we come to art and technical art. So when, when, I, when I speak about art, art has lots of stages. For example, concept art. So concept artists are people who, who make the first impressions of the game. So for example, there is a designer who wants to make a game. So let's make an analogy first. A game designer to a game is what a film director is to a film. The game designer has the vision of the game. He knows, he or she knows the story of the game or how the story should pan out. And then they will approach a group of technical art or a group of uh, concept artists. And the concept artists are going to give them the first draft of what the characters are going to look like, what the environment is going to look like, how the, um, the different parts of the game is going to look like, so on and so forth. Once they have their concept art locked, once they are happy with you know, the concept art that they find, then they are going to go into pre-production. Pre-production is where they flesh out the story, they they figure out and so a game is very a game is of, of course a storytelling medium but it's a very different medium than something like say a tv show or a movie because you get to interact with the game and if the story is amazing but you don't get to interact much you're just seeing one cut scene after another and because of the length of a game which is like seven hours eight hours 12 hours 30 hours long sometimes players are not very involved. The idea is to involve the player as much as possible in the story. So then the designer is going to go and find out people who can piece together how best to involve the player. What are the pieces of the game? What is, what is going to be the mechanics of maybe the fighting, of moving, of driving, or whatever whatever else? Then, then based on those mechanics, they're going to pace the story. And based on the story, then the rest of the art is going to follow. After that, you have something called technical art. People who are artists, because they have a sense of art, they, they basically create art, but they also do it programmatically. Or they, they do it using a lot of tools that programmers use. So that uh, entails something like shaders. Shaders is a piece of code that runs on graphics cards. That is very, very essential for, uh, for cutting edge graphics. Without the innovation in shaders, graphics and games is not was not supposed to be as beautiful as it is today and it will not get photorealistic in the future unless we make changes or make modifications in those shaders or you know make innovations there after that um once all of these things are locked in then we have the gameplay programmers which we talked about but there is one more set of people who are very important to this whole pipeline those are the pro project managers and the people who manage the teams those are the people who typically are not freshers in the industry, who come from some other discipline because they already know how a game production should work, but they do not actively help with production. What they do is they actively help with scheduling, they actively help with uh, figuring out what to do and when to do and how much to release in the first trailer and so on and so forth. And when is it a good time to evaluate the direction of the game how to best manage the team so that everyone has a good place to come to work and everyone brings their best um, best possible personality to work so that they can function in the most efficient way. 
So these are the four uh, major skill set or major career path that an individual can embark on. Of course, you can mix and match. You can be a programmer, then you can move over to technical art. If then you find out that you are good at storytelling and that is something that you're very passionate about, then you can also move into design and storytelling. And typically, after about a decade or so of experience in, in, in making a lot of games, you will be promoted to either project management or somebody who's called a producer of the game, who is the final boss of any game. Uh, so that's those are those are the kind of paths that you can think of if you think of a career in game development. The next slide, please. And how do we get to these paths? So there are two ways of going about it. Uh, game development is a relatively new field and compared to software development, it is definitely new because software development has been around since the 1930s. Game development is as, I, as we have seen in the uh, timeline, that it is kind of a thing since the 2000s. Before that, it was just hobbyists or people who uh, who made games in their spare time with no intent of making money. So how do you learn these skills? You can go to uh, any of the like universities that teach you game development. These are the three major universities that are most highlighted for their game development courses, but this is nowhere near a full list. The, uh, I'm going to share a list of top rated universities with the organizers of this uh, uh, convention so that they can share it with the students. But university or traditional uh, education is definitely a pathway uh, to learn the skills that are required to be in the industry. The other part is online training. If you want to be self-taught, if you don't want to go to university for this particular skill set, um, you can go to Udemy, lots of courses but very focused courses. So the difference between online training and university is that online training is going to teach you exactly what you want to know about one particular thing. There is not possibly not going to be a lot of holistic um, integration like a university gives you. For example, it's not going to teach you additional disciplines, uh, mathematics, physics, and uh, algebra and other disciplines. For example, phys uh, a lot of science is very much required uh, in order to be successful in a game development profession, especially if you're a programmer, you need to know programming quite well as well. Uh, Udemy or Coursera, they're going to teach you uh, the specifics of making maybe one particular type of game or maybe one particular uh, part of a game, maybe a mechanic, maybe a fighting technique or a driving technique or something. But they are there are very few courses in these areas where you can just go in as a complete fresher and you're going to get the full understanding. The idea of these courses is that you will start your journey and then you will learn as you grow because you will falter on your own. You will try and make a game and you might not be successful in making that. And then you will search for more answers and then you will find them. Uh, that might be a little bit lengthier way than going to a university. But at the same time, uh, your own failures can teach you a lot more than, you know, uh, some lecture in some university. So it goes both ways. So Udemy is a, is a fantastic resource for that. It can, of course, be a supplement. Like if you're going to a university to, to earn a degree in game development, then you can use Udemy as something like uh, a side where you can maybe specialize in a certain part of, of, of the discipline. Uh, Unity Learn is an excellent uh, resource that you can use, but it is unfortunately limited to only the use of Unity Engine. If you want to learn more about Unreal Engine or Godot, for example, Udemy is a, is a good resource. Coursera is a, is a little bit different here. Coursera does give you lengthier courses. It does give you uh, mini degrees or even graduate, graduate degrees, but typically those, and, and those are cheaper than a university degree, but typically those are delivered only online. There is no, um, no face-to-face -face or no classroom lectures in Coursera, that could be an impediment for some people in their learning. I have seen a lot of people learn a lot faster when they're around similar-minded people, when they have a lot of offline discuss discussions about what they're learning. So based on, the, based on your personality and your preferences, these resources could vary, their, their mileage could vary. But either way, you're going to go in any of the directions, you're definitely going to earn some skills from there if you're dedicated. Uh, next slide, please. So this is towards the end of my presentation, but because I want to keep as much time uh, possible 
for question and answers because that's how people um, that's how people kind of find out what they want to know. But these are these are the things that I uh, I have found a lot of refute in when I was starting out as a game developer about eight nine years ago. So the first question, of course, is how much do you like the games or how much do you like the field itself? How much do you do you play games all day? Can you play games all day if, if given the opportunity? Because more often than not, the games that you are working on, you would probably double up as a tester anyway, because testers are uh, are people who are not in good good supply in our industry. So everyone doubles up as a tester. Everyone tests their own game in some form or the other. So if given the opportunity of a one particular game, one particular level, one particular way of playing it, do you really like it that way? Or is it just the storytelling for you and once you're done with the game, you are you, you don't really want to do anything with it? Then it might be a very boring job throughout the day. The second point is, are you a curious learner? When I, when I, when I say curious learner, what I mean is that, do you ask a lot of questions? Are, if, when, you, when you see something happening, the way it is happening. Do you ask why is it so? Because that is an excellent, uh, excellent skill to have if you if you are in this particular field. More often than not, you're going to have a bug in a game because games are not games are of course huge pieces of softwares, but they don't really have a lot of flow as a traditional software software product does because they are after all a creative product and when something is being creative it's being made on the fly so when something is made on the fly chances are that you are probably not going to have a lot of planning of course there will be planning but not a lot of planning as to how to handle some edge case somewhere you know something might happen on a very sporadic occasion and if you spot that do you have the zeal to ask yourself why that is and dig through maybe the whole uh, you know code base of the game to find out why something is happening then the next question is, what is something that you really fancy yourself doing? Do you really like to tell stories? Because if you are a storyteller and if you are a game designer, then the game is your vision. You know, you are the director of the ship. Of course, you might be a part of a, of a larger design team. So the game is not totally your vision, but you have more say in the vision of the game than, for example, somebody who's just programming for the game. But on the other hand, if you if you are really interested in the technical execution of the game, for example, if you're really interested in how to formulate a particular mechanic and how best to do it, how to optimize it and so on, you might not have a lot of say in the flow of the story, but you will have a lot of lot of things to do in the actual player interaction because the players are going to play the the story that you have made. Of course, the story comes from somewhere else, but they are going to experience every line of code that you have written. And if none of these interest you, then are you interested in managing a team of talented individuals who are just passionate enough to make a game? That could also be a very, uh, very good career move. The next one is how keen are you on details? Because if you just gloss over stuff, then game development might be a very difficult field for you. Games typically, especially if you are in the programming side and you want to optimize a game. Typically, you want to have a very keen eye as to what's going on so that because um, our systems, the hardware that the game runs on, the hardware has very limited uh, number of processes or cycles that a CPU can run and you want to use the most of it, right? So you want to have the maximum, uh, for example, the maximum throughput from a cycle. So you have to see exactly what's happening if there's some path that can be trimmed from the code base. If there's something that is creating unnecessary cycles in the CPU that you can get rid of, but those do not come easy because there is, of course, the, you know, the straightforward way of doing something, but more often than not, the straightforward way is not the most optimized way. It might be a way to get something done, but it just is not the way to get something done for performance. And there are so many devices out there ranging from the most basic phones to very high-end PCs or consoles in order to have a game that runs on as many devices as possible so that you can have as many people playing your game as possible. Keen eye for details is one of the basic constructs that one must have. Uh, this is, thankfully, this is something that 
people can uh, practice and get good at. So that is, you know, that is that is not a big deal. If you don't have it, but you still want to be in the field, uh, this is something that you need to take care of at some point. The next last thing, last but not the least, and this is probably the biggest, it definitely isn't the least, that is proactiveness is rewarded. So I haven't answered one question yet. I'm quite sure somebody is going to ask it, but let me be proactive in this one. <laughs> so the question would be, how do you actually break into game development? Because uh, you probably don't see a lot of ads uh, for jobs that, you know, that, that belong to game developers. The answer is to, especially for somebody who's who's not experienced in the field, who doesn't have any game development experience. Uh, the answer is to have something called a showreel or a demo reel or, or some games that you have made in your free time ready to show. You know, if you are in the industry and you have done something that you are proud of, then there are lots of people who would look at it, who would give you critique on them, who would actually give you some suggestions as to make it better. And at every level, there is not a company that I've worked for or worked with that uh, who do not um, appreciate proactiveness, who do not appreciate your own efforts of bettering your skills in, in this particular uh, particular field. Game development is by and large a meritocracy. The better you are, you the higher your demand is going to be in the field. So absolutely go for it. If if there is something that you are that you that you feel you can learn on your own, maybe from YouTube, maybe from Udemy, and create just a small demo, just something that people can play, that people can have their hands on, then uh, you know it's gonna give you a long way ahead. Then a lot of people who might have even some experience on their uh, resume, but they don't have a product that uh, somebody can play. So after all, you're making games, right? Uh, games that people should be able to play. So that, you know, the proactiveness as much as you can, learning something ahead of time, doing something ahead of time, judging that you would be needing it at some point ahead of time is very, very rewarded. It's probably the biggest thing in the industry. Uh, next slide, please. So these are my contact details. I could be reached out on my work email, which is orf.chatterjee at unity3d.com. And there's my personal email ID as well. If you reach out to me there, you can, you are all of you, anyone who's watching this video, uh, you're most welcome to uh, reach out to my LinkedIn. Uh, just tell me that you have heard, uh, you know, heard of me from this particular uh, webinar and I would be more than happy to, uh, to accept your requests. You can also have a look at my personal projects uh, on this GitHub link. There are lots of unfinished projects, but again, the projects just show that I have tried to experiment on a certain uh, thing or a certain aspect of a, of a particular game or mechanic or whatever that has served me quite well in the industry so far. And the next slide is probably the last one, which is thank you and let's have some questions. Thank you, sir. We are indeed delighted to have you here with us today. Thank you for the valuable information, sir. I think you have answered most of our questions and clarified the points. Mm -hmm. We have a few more questions from our audience. Sir, yeah. how can game development can be incorporated to our academics? Okay, so game development is a combination of a lot of disciplines. It has art, of course, because you have concept artists who are practically artists who are just drawing concept stuff. So it can be incorporated in art studies if somebody wants to do that. A large part of it is technology. So it is somebody who's studying computer science or who wants to have a better knowledge of some, uh, you know, some, some programming languages. They are more than welcome to create a game and incorporate that. For example, I have created a lot of games and incorporated um, a lot of algorithms that I've learned in data structures. Games are visual medium. So as soon as you create something, you see the difference. So that is why it is more motivating rather than, you know, a boring console window. And also it's fun. And in the end, you would be proud of what, what you have done. So, and then, you know, the, the whole process is problem solving after all. So whoever is doing whatever art or, or technical execution, they would be solving some problems. So that would be very beneficial for, for any kind of academic senses. Thank you, sir. 
So can a student take a Bachelor of Compu Computer Application if a commerce student with information practices but no mathematics? See, this is this is the beauty of uh, this particular field. You don't have to have any um, any educational qualification to be here at all. As I said, it's a, it's meritocracy. So if you know how to do something, if you're passionate about something, and even if you don't have experience, if you have created uh, some sort of a demo reel with your work or GitHub profile with you know your uh, it's for programmers. Of course, if you if you are from the art background, you would probably create an art station profile and display your art. Uh, as a programmer, if you create a GitHub profile and just display the the things that you have done there, maybe create a demo and and send around to people, that's more than enough. Uh, so, you know, if coming from any background whatsoever, but at the same time, if you don't have mathematics, it's fine. There are so many uh, resources out there that actually teaches you the basic mathematics, and trust me, it's not it's not difficult because computers, after all, do a lot of computation for you. It's just you have to tell them what to do. Uh, and I believe anyone can learn that mathematics. Of course, you know, any of the students who want to have maybe a review of their mathematics concepts uh, can reach out to me. Feel free to do that. Thank you, sir. What advice would you give to the students aspiring to build a career in game design, particularly in terms of education and portfolio building? Yeah, so I would say portfolio is more important than maybe a formal education or a degree. A degree is of course a leg up because what you get with a degree from one of the institutes I mentioned is the alumni network. Who Most of them are well placed in big studios and you get that network, you can connect with them and maybe you get a leg up in the studio. Maybe the studio has a deal with, uh, sorry, the university has a deal with a studio that can give you an internship or something. But at the same time, you're not going to sustain without a good portfolio. So the advice is to just go to art station. If, if we are talking about art, uh, then just go to art station. Find out, okay, even before going to art station, start your favorite game, look up the people who have made the, those games and look them up on art station, the artists basically and try and figure out what their portfolio entails. Then the next thing that you would want to do is go to the websites of the, you know, the, the developers, the game developers, the studios where you want to work maybe someday, Rockstar, Ubisoft, EA, wherever, the bigger the name, the better, and find out the job that you want to have and look at all the qualifications that the person who's, you know, who's, who's fit for the job must have as mentioned in the job advertisement. And then from there, from, from the backward, start building your portfolio. In that way, you would have a much more um, much more chance of you know, achieving that particular position than just going out of nowhere and trying to create something from nothing. So this is a more methodical approach. But of course, you can experiment in any way you want that is highly recommended uh, in this particular field. And yeah, I mean, when you land your first job, just let me know. It's, it's of course, very special. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So what can we expect for an interview as a game developer? Okay, so it depends on which kind of role you're applying for. If you are applying for an art role, then you can expect uh, some sort of an assignment given to you for a period of time, maybe a week or two days or three days, based on the complexity of the assignment. And you have to complete that assignment and submit uh, to, the, uh, to the studio. After the and for the programmer, then this there is also an assignment for them. So for both the roles, you will have an assignment that is given to you, maybe a very small demo. For programmers, there's an additional step uh, which some big companies do to screen is that they will give you some sort of an online programming test that is a time test. For example, you start it and maybe it, it runs out in an hour or so. You have to complete it within that hour. After that, there would be a couple of technical interviews for both disciplines. For an artist, they would probably be asked about questions about light theory, color theory, and what is rendering, how how they feel some things might be there, what are what might be the uh like what is their idea about tessellation and how many triangles or vertices generally do they have in their models and so on. For a programmer, it would be very technical. For example, it might sound nothing like a game development interview, but very much like a software developer interview, wherein you might be asked a lot about some design patterns, some algorithms, data structures, your basics in computer science. 
After that, there might be an advanced level of technical interview based on your performance on the previous one. There, uh, for a programmer, there might be a whiteboard test that you might be invited over to one of the studios or maybe it can happen over Zoom that they will give you a problem and for an hour, you and the interviewer are going to solve that particular problem together. Of course, you don't have to write code, but you can write pseudo code or you can tell the interviewer what your idea is about breaking that problem down and solving it. That is very, this is a very crucial part of the interview. It tests problem solving skills for somebody and their their demeanor or their how they react under pressure when they are solved, when they're faced with a problem that they have never faced before. For an artist, it might be another technical round of interview, or they might be given a bigger part of art that might actually go into the game or that might be very similar to the actual you know the actual game production pipeline just to test whether the art that they 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 pour out actually is even compatible with the game or not for the programmer the problem solving skill uh, is a lot more involved than the artist part because it's just another assignment for them and after that generally in european studios and in American studios, there is a round where they test whether you fit with the team. They are going to get you in with a few members who you would probably not work with. For example, somebody from the HR, somebody from finance, somebody from management, who you probably won't be working with on a daily, day-to-day -day basis. But how you gel up with them is going to be a factor. And after all of this, there's either the offer or they might find somebody else. But this is largely, this is the procedure. Now, each of these stages could be subdivided into two, three stages. For example, Ubisoft is notoriously known for their length of interviews because they take a lot of time. Somebody like an indie studio, they might just have two or three rounds of interviews and, and finalize or not. So this is largely the procedure of interviews in the industry right now. Thank you, sir. What inspired, to become, what inspired you to become a game developer? Yeah, that's a very funny story because uh, I remember to have had my first uh, console when I was about eight years old. It was not even an original one. It was one of those Chinese counterfeit version of the uh, SNES. And it played tons of games like, you know, you have to insert the cartridges in the console and play games on, on those. That literally changed my life. I mean, I used to play a lot of outdoor games before that. I still played after that also. But that kind of entertainment uh, that was a that was a wonder that i haven't yet gotten out of so while growing up it was always very clear that i wanted to be part of the industry part of the group of people who do this because i wanted to bring that kind of feelings in more people the kind of feelings that i uh, found uh, uh, about 8 years old being about 8 years old and then i had a very brief stint in the animation industry where I learned about animation, 3D art and so on. It was a very small one. I just had an internship there, but it really helped me figure out or really helped me open my eyes about how art is produced uh, in the back end. And then I went to university to study computer science. And both of these together, when I came out, I was it was like on my mind that, yes, if I can get an opportunity to be a game developer, then that would be probably more like worth it than any other jobs that I could have. And thankfully, I got my first job as a game developer right out of university. A lot of people are not that fortunate and I was ready to, because game development itself is, you know, the, the, the job satisfaction is probably one of the highest in the world that you get in the end, because you are playing or you are making a game that millions of people are gonna play at some point and you are gonna bring so much of happiness to all of those lives. Um, so yeah, that's that's really my story. It's It's short, but, I, it probably doesn't encompass how much emotional connect I have uh, with this field. This is something that I would definitely talk about. Uh, a large amount of large dose of passion is required for this particular discipline if you want to get into this, this industry. So, uh, which is the favorite game you played and favorite game you made or worked out? Okay, so my favorite game that I've made that is very very close to my heart it is hills of steel 2. it was already a published game when i joined the project but we were going through major overhauls when i joined it and i created i i was part of the team that created major ui changes for that game it was not well received initially players just 
bamboozled us because they didn't like the new UI, but eventually they got used to it. And that was also the first time when I had some dealings with backend. So I'm really, really proud of that product. I really wish that, you know, Hills of Steel 2, it, it runs for as many years as it can. It's already about four years now, four years old now. And for a mobile game, uh, which is available on Android and iOS, that's a very big deal uh, for, a, for a studio size as it was when I was there. Uh, one of like my favorite games are largely story driven. I was really interested in, in, in the PlayStation exclusive. So, you know, for me, it kind of changes just like my favorite movie, because each time I see a new one and I like it, my favorite movie changes it's like that. My favorite game also keeps on changing, but I really think technically, um, I must say the Spider-Man games on, on PlayStation, they are really well made. Then there's uh, God of War, The Last of Us, of course, the Call of Duty franchise, because I have been a huge fan of those growing up. Not so much of multiplayer, but definitely the, uh, the, the single player campaign back in the day. I played a fair amount of NFS. I am unfortunately not a fan, a plan of, a fan of FIFA, but uh, I know of I know a lot of people who swear by those games. So that, yeah, I mean, my favorite games are, it's like, the list is quite long. Thank you, sir. The constructive views and information that you shared with us today is quite beneficial. And we are sure that the students and parents had a fulfilling session. Hope you had a fruitful time. Thank you for your cooperation. This is Pooja and Rida signing off on behalf of Indian School Darsits for Avenir 2023. Bye and have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.